Time to take a look at various parts of fortification elements during the Middle Ages. Let's begin with the towers, which could be placed in various different ways in relation to the walls at the corners, centered along the wall, shifted a bit inside or positioned outward. The later option allowing for better flanking fire, but also exposing the tower more. Note that nowadays when we think of castles, we usually think about stone and sometimes brick castles. But those were rather uncommon initially in the Middle Ages. The first castles were mostly created from wood and earth. Yet most of those didn't really survive the ages, so even for Europeans they are rather unknown. Similarly, when it comes to towers, we think of them as enclosed buildings. But this wasn't necessarily so. There were towers that were open at the back. This actually had several advantages. First off, less construction material was required, thus they were cheaper. Second, it was easier to haul supplies in and out of the tower. And third, if the tower was captured by the enemy, it provided only a limited amount of protection. In general, walls came in various variations, stone, wood or a combination of both. Of course, in some cases there was probably gradual transition and the wooden elements usually didn't survive, so we have limited information on them. When it comes to shapes, in the Middle Ages initially square tiles were the most common. But that setup created dead angles and thus was not ideal. Although the Romans already used circular D-shaped towers, it took some time until polygonal and circular towers were used in medieval times. Now there were special kinds of towers, which to a certain degree were also the earliest forms or at least precursors of castles, namely the Keep, Doshon and Bergfried. Note that they are not the same type of building. They are similar in many aspects, but there is a difference in time and region. Now the main difference of a keep to a regular tower was location and function. Whereas a tower was usually part of the outer walls or stockades, the keep was usually located inside the castle. Additionally, the keep often had additional administrative, representative and residential function, whereas a regular tower had mostly a military function. Now short note if you ever take a castle tour. Towers were virtually windowless because windows created weak points, jeopardizing the security of the entire castle. Only residential towers like the keep actually had windows. You might want to keep that in mind if you visit a castle nowadays, because windows there might be actually the result of later changes and renovations and not be part of the original setup. Another special kind of tower was the gatehouse, which was usually also the first kind of tower built into the walls and stockades. Since the gate was the natural point of entry into a castle, it would also present the weakest link in the fortification, if special measures weren't taken. So let's take a look at some of those measures. Now if the castle was protected by a moat, the gate also housed some kind of drawbridge. Those could be simple bridges pulled by winches or ideally with countervites, which allowed a faster handling. There were also rolling bridges that could be retracted and bridges using pivots, which I call flipping bridges. The major part of a gatehouse was one or several fortified gates. Additionally, the gatehouse could also contain one or several portcullises. They were made from wood, iron or a combination of both. The gatehouse could include various features like simple openings to mount beams to strengthen the door or several areas separated by gates and portcullises in case one of the defensive lines was broken. This could include murder holes that allowed to drop stones and fire arrows or pull hot liquids from above into the areas below. Note that in some cases gatehouses were built so sophisticated that they resembled a little castle of their own. Next up battlements, which are the upper parts of fortified positions. In case of a castle, the whole upper part was called a battlement or a crenellation, whereas the openings are called crenellus or embrasures and the higher parts smaller. In places like England it required a permission from the king to add battlements to a castle. The shape of the merlons varied widely and they also had a social and decorative function. It is assumed that most surviving merlons are probably modern reconstructions and does not really reflect what they might have looked originally. Additionally, wooden elements like shutters could be used to increase the protection of the battlements. Another more permanent option were loopholes in the merlons or parts of the walls. Now loopholes had many different shapes and based on their shape, we can actually derive of what kind of weapon they were probably used for. The vertical ones were mainly used for bows. The horizontal ones for crossbows and surprise, those that resembled crosses were suited for bows and crossbows. Loops for handguns were also mostly vertical, but often had at least one circular exit point. The most sophisticated loopholes had mechanisms that allowed them to be turned, thus functioning a bit like a turret. Another additional defensive measure were hoardings, 
virtual wooden structures with various openings that provide an extended and protected area over the walls, thus allowing to drop and fire on troops standing close to the walls. It is assumed that hoardings were mostly a temporary measure and used at critical points. Similar to other castle elements, there were also stone versions of hoardings added to castles, called Michicolations, which were usually more sophisticated and came in various types. Not to the final part, the moat, which was a fundamental part even of the early castles in the Middle Ages, unless the location didn't allow for them. Moats did not always enclose the whole fortification, furthermore, they weren't necessarily filled with water. After all, filling them with water required a large water source and also some work. In other words, it could be quite expensive. The main criteria of an effective moat was that it was wide enough to prevent jumping over it and deep enough to prevent just walking through it, which was achieved with 3 meters of depth. But later on, they were much deeper. Although initially water-filled moats in Western Europe were rare, in Eastern Europe the situation was different due to castles often being located near water sources. As a result, moats were often filled up by the underlying water table. Although initially water-filled moats in Western Europe were uncommon, they became quite popular later on. But let's look at the advantages of moats. The main ones were as follows. First, the moat broke the momentum of any charging enemy even without walls. Second, various siege engines couldn't be properly used or needed to be built in a way that it accounted for the additional distance to cover. Third, similar to modern mines, a moat is an area denial weapon, thus it will funnel the enemy into a specific area that allows the defender to concentrate its forces and equipment. Fourth, even if the attacker would score a wall breach due to missile weapons, it would be impossible to exploit such a breach immediately if the moat wasn't filled up at the location already. Fifth, if a moat was deep enough, it provided a good defense against mining operations, especially if they were filled with water. Well, I think this covered the basics of fortifications. As always, all sources are linked in the description. I know some of you are interested in photos and videos of castles. I intend to visit some castles in the summer to provide proper footage, which is very likely to happen thanks to my Patreons that enable me to invest more money in various projects and books. If you like this video, you might want also check out my other castle video or take a look at the Atlantic Wall. Thank you for watching and see you next time.